Well, hello again, and welcome back. Thanks again for checking us out. And if you like what you hear, please go over to iTunes, give us a five-star rating and review, or give us any review. We just want to hear from you. We want to know what you think, what we can do better, what more we can bring you. But today, we have an awesome guest. We've been trying to put this together for a while. Super psyched to have him, Evan Holiday. Hey, Evan, how you doing? Great, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. Excited. Well, very excited to have you. And so Evan is the founder and host of Monumental, and it's a top-rated podcast where he interviews leaders, entrepreneurs, and visionaries making massive change in the world. And Evan, he was based in Louisville, made the move down to Nashville. They're handling building quality communities and empowering residents through an affordable workforce, uh, workforce housing development, which is basically making up 80% of his operation. So Evan, that's the short recap. Fill us in. Tell us about you. Tell us what you've been working on. Tell us what you're currently working on. Yes. So a little background. So I, I like to tell everybody it, it kind of got started. The, the addiction to real estate got started in college. Uh, I went to University of Louisville and in college I was going the pre-med route. And I was like, you know what, this, this whole pre-med, like the, the science, the chemistry, it's really just not doing it for me. And <clears throat> that's when I, I saw this development going in on campus and it was like $55 million development just been announced. I was like, man, like, what do I need to do to be a part of that? And, um, and one thing led to another, I talked to my mentor about it and he's like, Oh really? He's like that, that interests you. I'm like, yeah, it does. He's like, well, I actually know the owner developer and I'll introduce you. And one thing leads to another. I impress him enough to get a job and I'm basically the first one hired and learn the, the whole you know, development side of the business, the property management, the lease up, there were retail tenants, there was you know, new market tax credits. Um, it, it was just a very complex deal. And here I was like 19 years old, like trying to just soak it all in and be a part of it and, and um, learned a lot in that deal, learned what not to do as well. Um, and then myself and four others in college, we were part of a, a, an entrepreneurship class and part of the class was to start a company. And so we're like, well, what can we do? And, and of course I'm like in love with real estate now. And I'm like, well, let's start a real estate company. And so we decided to start a modular development company. Uh, so we were actually basically building uh, components of a house and then eventually multifamily housing in a warehouse that was actually set up to build for, um, for houseboats. So Kentucky has all these warehouses that build um, these manufacturing plants that build houseboats. They laid off 1,100 skilled workers. So we're like, how do we put those people back to work, use these dormant facilities and build something that's energy efficient and get it to market quicker? Wow. Yeah. And so we built some single family and then we were trying to scale it up to multifamily and, and gain some efficiencies. And uh, we're looking for basically partners with capital and experience, two things we did not have. And, um, and in the process, I found a group and, and basically played around a golf with them. And by the end of it, they're like, they're like, so, uh, would you want to come work with us? And, and one thing leads to another. And I basically worked with them for six years, learning the ropes. Um, they had many years of experience at one of the top developers in the country and really got to cut my teeth there. I got to basically, I've sourced, you know, over 1300 units of all new construction, new development financed it, got it closed, got them built, got them leased up, learned a whole heck of a lot. And so just this last year, uh, we started Holiday Ventures where we're basically doing the, the very similar work, uh, but really taking that to the next level of saying, you know, how can we make a massive change in affordable housing and workforce housing, creating attainable housing options for families out there. Uh, and, and also, you know, being able to create that long-term generational wealth for our family and also so we can have that impact uh, as well through giving back and, and philanthropy and charity. But it, it's really, it's been a blast um, being able to work with cities, work with communities, um, a lot of creative financing, a lot of, a lot of brain damage too, because it, it's just, you're dealing with this very um, nuanced government financing. Um, and a lot of people don't understand it. They think when they hear affordable, they hear, you know, the ghetto or the projects. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately that's not at all what we build. We build like class A quality stuff. Uh, we just don't have to put a ridiculous price tag on the rent. So um, in a nutshell, that's, that's pretty much it. And then we have the, like we talked about the podcast 
uh, which we've been going strong for about two years now, and then also do uh, help people with coaching as well. I love that. So I definitely want to dive into the affordable housing and break it down. Give us all the dummies approach of how we understand <laughs> that. But before we do I love that, it. Have, have you always grown up entrepreneurial? Because I mean, you're still very young and there's a lot of young listeners here that are saying, man, at 19, he's got a mentor. He's out there taking action. It, one, talk to us about that. Because most people don't, don't find that until, you know, late 20s, 30s, 40s, even just saying, well, I need a mentor. How did, how did you know that you needed that? And, and maybe some tips, like what, what makes a good mentor where you can bring value to that person and possibly have them on your team? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think honestly, it starts with those around you that are already like, in that case, the mentor in college, like he was already putting himself out there within our fraternity of saying, hey, I want to help you guys. And so I was one of a few, very few guys that actually took him up on it. You know, it's so I guess one of the first things is in that certain situation, a lot of this could apply to listeners where it's like, hey, there's there's already individuals around you that are willing to to give you their time. You just have to be open or, or have open eyes to be able to accept it when it comes your way and take take full advantage of those situations. Like I took him to lunch multiple times because he was willing and able and wanting to help. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to take full advantage of that. I want to know you know, what, what brings success? What, what has been successful in his life? What does he learn not to do? You know, I, and you know, I, I was very fortunate for that because it, it built a foundation of learning what I could do to set myself up, how to reach out to people, how to make connections. Um, and I, and I think it just comes from finding people that are willing to help you. And then also being able to figure out some way you know, it didn't necessarily happen that way with this relationship, but find a way where you can add value to that person um, is is key. Yeah, that's amazing, right? And the, the key part you put on there is that if you keep your ears open, it's all around you. Everybody's around you. There's so many people out there that are willing to help, but you need to take action. You need to take those steps to get there. And what are some of the mental hurdles that you've been able to overcome that you see in a lot of other people that keep them from taking action? Because sometimes the steps are so simple, yet everybody's saying, uh, hold on, there must be something to this. Yeah, I would say, and I've been guilty of this myself, and I've, I've worked on this. Um, I would say analysis paralysis, like it's just you, you overthink things, you think you have to have everything perfect. Uh, and I, I've had that happen to myself, but, but I've realized when, I'm, when I am most successful, it's when I take massive action right out of the gate you know, it's good to have a plan in place, but you don't need to have a perfect plan. You know, it's the whole adage of, you know, a, a good plan is a plan executed. A perfect plan executed two weeks later really doesn't mean anything. Um, and, and I think that is so true where if you're just taking action and telling yourself, hey, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to know every step. I'm actually going to learn just the next step in front of me. And we were actually just having a conversation about this before uh, where it's, it's literally about, you know, thinking about if you're going to drive on a back road, a foggy back road, mm -hmm. think about, don't, don't think about the whole road. Think about just the next eight feet. That's all you can really see because of the fog. So think about the next eight feet. What are you going to do next? Not think about the whole process. Yeah, it's great. It's like that uh, movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio, where they, they ask him, you know, like in real life, he's like, he teaches like, a, like, a, like something beyond complicated, like a chemistry class, when he has never had any course in chemistry. And they're like, well, well, how did you teach this um, high level college chemistry course? He's like, well, I just read one chapter ahead each time and just read it back to the students. They're like, oh. <laughs> but it's just yeah. sometimes we, we outthink ourselves that we have to know everything. And by that time, you never know anything, right? Like riding a bike, starting out there. So yeah, and I love it. You've taken so much action for the affordable housing space. Maybe beneficial would be that, could we talk through mm -hmm. steps? And of course, it's very complicated. So, so from a, g a generic standpoint of, of breaking it down and maybe even a project you are, have done as a case study, or just something that can align so investors can, can listeners can comprehend just the scope, why it made sense, what you're looking for, what the reach was and the, and the potential to really help so many people that potentially don't have access to the right housing and what's the outlook for the property. Yes. Yeah, so I'll walk you through a specific deal we did here in Nashville uh, we closed in 2016. Uh, we just recently, I think 20, 
end of 2018, we finally got it leased up and stabilized. Hmm. And, um, and really <clears throat> the genesis behind it is like affordable housing is for families making 30 to 65,000 roughly, you know, it depends on the, depends on the city. It depends on the Metro average income, but basically we take 60% of the average and those are our individuals or families that can qualify for affordable or workforce housing. And it's typically 30 to 70 or 30 to 65,000. And what we do is we partner with cities. We partner with States to basically they'll bring in part of the funding and in return for part of that funding, we agree to keep our rents at a, at a affordable level, at a level where uh, our residents are not paying any more than 30% of their monthly paycheck. Now, are you leading the charge to the states, to the cities, or do they have these programs already readily available for investors like yourself to help out with? Uh, they, yeah, they have programs already set up. And so basically you need to make sure your projects are fitting into those boxes that they want and, and that clearly set out what they're targeting. Uh, so it starts at the state level. Uh, if you're going after tax credits, basically they're federal tax credits. They come from federal government. They get allocated to each state based on population. Uh, and then those states decide which projects get awarded. Um, and so for the, for the type of credits that we, that we utilize for our financing, we cover roughly 40% of the cost of construction with our credits. And so that, that's what helps us pay for 40%. We have a loan for 50% and we find a grant or tax abatements or other funding for the other 10%. Mm -hmm. um, so of that 40%, we basically are awarded the credits and then we actually turn around and sell those credits to an investor, typically a bank or insurance or, or large institution. And, and then they get a dollar for dollar write off on their taxes with that credit. Got and it. so that, that's their incentive to, to invest in this. And they're actually looking for depreciation losses and the tax credits. So really it's almost like a, a, a tax deferral investment or a tax write off investment. Like they're looking at ways to lower their tax liability with this investment. So um, if someone who's looking into this, and I'll just ask a couple specific steps. So if someone is saying this sounds like something that could be super beneficial to a lot of people in need of great housing, how would they search something in this magnitude? Would you literally just go on the county website and search in uh, tax credits? Would that be as simple as that starting the project? Yeah. Anybody getting started, I would say, uh, first off, I would say find, find a mentor, find somebody that's willing to teach you. Um, because of it, and especially because this is so complicated, it's so niche within multifamily, within real estate, commercial real estate investing. Um, and, and there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of regulations and it varies state by state as well. Um, so like I, you know, I could give you good guidance, but I wouldn't tell you exactly what to do in California because I've never done anything there, which is really interesting that it's so state specific. Sure. But yes, I would, I would start out by looking, Googling tax credits per state. Uh, there's usually a state housing uh, authority or, or agency, and they're the ones that, that basically set the rules. There's, there's a, what you call a qualified allocation plan per state. Uh, each one has a QAP is what they call it. And that's basically the rule book and the, the scoring guideline more or less uh, for that year. And they change it every year. And that's how you can basically go forward and request based on a project tax credits. And so you put together an application and you want to want be one of, you know, the top scores for that, uh, for that funding round. And they yeah. typically do RFPs where they put out a request for proposals and then you submit your project. Um, so there, there's a little bit of risk on the front end, but you can spend very little and still be able to, to put in an application for a project. And honestly, there is, um, there is an ability to basically get credits on a project without much experience at all. Uh, it helps if you have a mentor or you're aligned with somebody that has experience. Sometimes the states give out points specifically for experience. So you need to have somebody on your team. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's groups out there that will get started with a small project, get awarded credits, sell the credits, build a project just like any other project. And, and, be able to, to parlay that into the next project. Interesting. Now, what makes a market a viable candidate to be able to go through on such a course of action? Yeah, the, the biggest thing is uh, job growth, 
uh, you know, growth of the economy. It's, it's the same thing we're looking at, you, you know, market rate investors are looking at, it's very similar. Um, the only added component I would say, or, or two components I would add in is that we're looking for cities that are, uh, being proactive about investing in affordable housing. So we're looking for cities that are maybe setting up funding or making, you know, making permitting easier or expedited for affordable housing or saying like the, like the mayor or the city council is saying, Hey, like raising their hand and saying, Hey, we need affordable housing. It's a problem. It's a crisis. Like we are going to do whatever we can to make it easier for affordable developers to come to our city because it's becoming a prevalent need, like all across the country. Sure. And so, so that makes for us, we're like, well, you know, this is a great problem to have or, or our pri- our developments are high in demand right now, but also we're like, well, let's, let's try to spend our time where we're most wanted yeah. because that makes our life a lot easier. These, you know, these projects are already super complex and, and hard to get done. So if you have a, a politician basically putting a wall up, then that just makes it a hundred times harder uh, because they do hold a lot of power as far as uh, entitlements, permitting, zoning, even financing. So without their support, it's really, it's like trying to, you know, push a rock uphill. It's just not going to happen yeah, without their support. That's a huge golden nugget, right? And this can go to any, any form of real estate. If there's an area that's aligned for wanting this to happen, well, yeah, that's definitely viable. It's a factor you need to take place. I mean, if all the metric standpoints stand out, you know, if population growth, job growth, job diversity, large MSA, but the city is fighting you tooth and nail and say it's like Airbnb, right? Or something of that. Yeah. So, well, it's probably not going to be the right choice, even though the metrics are numbers. So you always want to add in that part. What is the government um, infrastructure and how is it aligned with what I'm trying to do here? So yeah. the project you started in 2016, that project, uh, ground up construction? Or, or Yep. Yeah. So ground up new construction, uh, 240 units on 13.7 acres. Uh, and we, I think we bought the land for 1.35 million. Uh, so just under, you know, uh, a hundred thousand an acre, which at the time wasn't bad, but it was crazy by the, by the time. So we buy the land here, you know, we buy the land a year or two before we're actually ready to close. We, we could not get everything aligned. And these deals take a while sure. to get every agency on board, the tax credits, the city. And so we had to unfortunately buy the land ahead of time. We don't like to do that. Um, but we knew this project would get closed. Um, but yes, by the end of it there, we were actually getting offers for the land for double what we had paid for it. Uh, wow. because Nashville is just crazy right now and lots of, lots of people moving here. Um, but we decided to go forward with the project, but in the kind of the, the way that this project got financed was we basically, we had the major support of the housing authority. Uh, major support of the mayor's office. They just hadn't really seen too many affordable developments go through, or at least to this scale, we were doing 204 units. Most projects to, to date prior in Nashville were, were like 40 to 60 unit deals. Hmm. And they needed 31,000 units. They did a report. They're like, we need 31,000 units. We can't get it done with a little 40 unit, 60 unit deals. Like we need massive action. And so here we were coming in and saying, Hey, you know, we got 240 units we want to do. And they're like, yes. So we, we were awarded a $1.7 million home grant, which is kind of like a soft loan. It's payable out of cash flow whenever you have cash flow available. Um, so it's almost like a grant, but you still pay it back. Got it. Um, and so we awarded that. That was kind of the, the Kickstarter for it. And then we were going through and we realized we're like, we were underwriting the deal. We were going through with a HUD 221D4 loan and we had our equity signed up. And then we realized, we talked to our local attorney. We'd never done a deal in Tennessee before. And he's like, hey, uh, your, your real estate taxes are really, really low compared to what they will be because they double tax you on tax credits in Tennessee. It's this weird phenomenon. We could go into that in, in a lot of depth, but basically- um, you have a mentor, right? Going for anybody listening. This is why exactly, you exactly. Together. You have your checks and balances across the board. So. And and have consultants on your team. You know, especially if you're doing a deal you've never done before. Like, like this attorney, he's basically the go-to guy in Tennessee for all tax credit deals. Uh, and so, of course, we're like, we need this guy on our team. And you know, he's been a, a close advisor of mine ever since. But that that 
what he told us was like, whoa, like we're completely underwriting this deal wrong. Our taxes are half what they should be. So we put in the number like, whoa, this deal doesn't work anymore. Wow. Like completely doesn't work. And so we had to go back to the city and say, hey, like what can we do about taxes? Because yeah. you guys really want this deal. And that's why it goes back to like having them on your side of like saying you guys are both on the same side of the table yeah. and both fighting for the same thing. Then it makes it way easier to make that ask of saying, hey, look, like we're not trying to make more money. We're just trying to make the deal work. Like it just doesn't even work without some sort of help on the taxes. So we actually went the long story short, we went to the state, got the state to um, basically rewrite their their tax code to allow for Metro Nashville to, to do tax abatements for affordable housing. And so we got the first tax abatement for affordable housing in Nashville, got it approved and then closed like two months later. And uh, the deal has been, you know, a home run ever since. And we basically, I think it was $34 million build out. And um, we, as we were turning units, as we were opening um, buildings, we literally had a wait list and we we're having everybody move in the same day. So we we're having like every month, we'd get two buildings and we'd move in 48 families. And um, at, by the end of it, we had a 1500 family wait list. Wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. And so it shows, proves the concept and the model, proves the city's on board, allows you to get in there and shows where the demand's gonna go for the future. Yeah, well done, that's sweet, man. So for this point, for just to recap, you're fine the property, you're gonna get the tax credits, hopefully for about 40%. You're gonna sell them off to an investor or a bank, and then you're gonna compound that with a loan of some capacity for maybe another 50%, and then the last 10% is gonna come from some additional credit, and this is gonna make up your 34, $35 million uh, build out for that point. It's allowing you to yep. do something that was not only beneficial for, of course, the city, but is also going to help a number of people around there. And yep. so for that, I'm sure people are going to ask the question, well, how do you make money from that? How does the investor make money from that? Or what is the drive that people can do this besides the, um, the, the goodwill factor to it? Right, right. Um, so really the incentive for uh, for-profit developers to get into this is really based around like they, you can collect a 15% developer fee. So same as, you know, an acquisition fee on a value add syndication deal, um, you know, it's, it's significant. Um, and you're typically, you're not actually collecting that full fee. You're going to defer part of that. And that's technically part of your equity in the deal. So it's almost like the only equity that you need to have in the deal after you closed is a fee that is like a future fee, right? Like, so we'll typically defer, you know, 50% or so of our fee. Um, so we'll in the paid out portion is paid from closing through stabilization. And then uh, the deferred fee is basically paid out of cash flow. Interesting. So, so that's the incentive. And then the other incentive is uh, we are investors, like I'd mentioned before, they're, they're only incentivized by the losses and depreciation. Um, so we actually get 90% of the cash flow. Uh, they don't want the cash flow. They'd prefer to have only losses. So we get all the cash flow and we get the 15% developer fee. Very interesting. Great model. Very well and entertaining about the way you put this together. And just it just shows there's so many ways that you can help out there. And something that I can win on our formats is just, it, it's a great resource. So for, for investors listening, super complicated model, right? But if you have the right team on board yeah. and you do the steps that Evan did, you can break it down and everything that seems complicated on the surface became, I won't call it routine because going in and resetting laws in the state are probably not routine. <laughs> but in that fact, it becomes real because you have actual steps to it. So I don't want to let you go before we, we talk about your podcast. You've had a, a really awesome time getting your podcast going, having great guests, talking to just dynamic people and for building a brand or, or, or reaching out and just building out a model for yourself. What can a podcast do and what has a podcast done for yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love talking about this because I tell everybody, I'm like, if you don't have a podcaster or a platform, you know, to speak on, then start one today. You know, if you're listening right now, like start a podcast, start a platform, just make YouTube videos or, or make a video on Instagram, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be complex, but it really, for me, like monumental, we've been doing it for two years. 
over a hundred episodes and, and just in two years, the amount of people I've been able to meet, um, the guests we've been able to meet, um, the conferences we've been invited to, you know, the, the connections we've been able to make, the people we've been able to impact from the podcast. Um, we've also gotten, I've gotten a deal out of it. Um, a, a very large deal we're working on right now, a new construction deal. Uh, the partner actually reached out to me cause they, f- they heard a podcast episode and they're like, Hey, this guy would be great for, you know, the affordable housing portion of this development. It's like Interesting. things like that just come out of nowhere and, and you can't plan on that, but it, it's, it's a tremendous ROI. It's just amazing. And it also gives me an excuse to talk to people that maybe I wouldn't have an opportunity opportunity to otherwise. I mean, the amount of people I get to, to talk to on a, you know, on the podcast is, is phenomenal. I mean, we've had on like David Meltzer, Elena Cardone, um, a, a lot of other top names, and we're going to have a lot more this year too. And, and it's basically just a lot of that comes from um, Instagram DMs. Awesome. So I highly recommend, I basically learned that from um, a 20 year old who's crushing it on podcasts. His name's Casey Adams. And um, he just said, he's like, all I did was DM people. I was like, I need to really double down on my DMing yeah. and it worked. I mean, it's just a numbers game. If you, if you reach out to enough people, um, then, then it's bound to come back. So it's been highly fruitful. I recommend it to everyone. Yeah. I love that. And it's great. And so if you're scared to start it, here's, here's the honest truth. You're not going to be great when you start. No one's Walter Concrete when they start literally the podcast, right? It, but you have to get out there and do it and give yourself a couple episodes. Don't just do one and said, Oh, that was hard. Put out there five and give yourself some context and do it. Evan's done a, a wonderful job. He just gave you a million reasons why you should do it. He even gave you the end DM people on Instagram. Literally that right yeah. there is gold. But if you DM one person, they're not going to get back to you. That's just a numbers game, right? He's DM a hundred people and he's got some awesome guests come on the show. So you take action, you put, put it out there and Evan, it just well done. So I, I do want to make the point here that Evan has uh, it, it's bitly.com backslash Evan bio. Is that correct? Yep. Right there. And that link will, will lead uh, listeners to what? Uh, so I, I would send them to evanholiday.com. Uh, and then holidayventures.com if they're interested in investing. Awesome. And then, of course, Instagram. I'm very active there. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, Evan, I'm glad we were able to put this together. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Super appreciate your time. Yes, thank you, Jason. Awesome. Listeners, thank you guys. Thank you for being on with us. Love everything you're doing. Love everything you're bringing out for us and love all the attention that you've brought to our show. Thank you so much. Have a great day.